if you don't like what I say, you know, turn me off, go listen to something else instead. Jews are disproportionately good with money. Well, if that was said by someone who's not Jewish, that would be anti-Semitism. To which I say that that is unadulterated bilge war. And the answer is, if you have to ask that question, you are a moron. I tell you the honest truth, I would love to hear a definition of anti-Semitism. I have absolutely no idea what it is. But if you tell me you're in love with her, then I need a bath bucket. <laughs> because I, I'm allergic to dumb people, I really am. Oh, I love her. We're in love. If you get married on that basis, you deserve everything that's coming to you. <laughs> and, and plenty is coming to you. So my guest today is repeat for the third time on a seven-figure squad, Rabbi Daniel Lappin, known as America's Rabbi, is a noted rabbinic scholar, best-selling author, and TV host, and is one of America's most eloquent speakers in one of the best areas of my conversation with Rabbi Lappin is his ability to break down biblical wisdom and make it into real-time, actionable steps. So Rabbi Daniel Lappin, welcome back to the seven figure squad thank you very much indeed i'm i'm feeling kind of boosted by uh, by being a third time repeat so thanks for having me back and uh, look i i love how you help uh, your entire base towards uh, better earning better living and and that ties in with exactly what i do which is helping people increase their revenue their income I love it. I love it. And uh, we've learned so much from your videos and our episodes with you. It's probably one of our most viewed watch videos, right, Evan? It's probably one of our most watched views on, on, our, on our channel. A lot of people are getting um, a lot of information from it, a lot of uh, uh, what would I call paradigm shifts. And um, the, the, the groups of folks, I shared this with you in the past, the groups of folks have learned with the most about finance, about money, about entrepreneurship. It's not necessarily my own Christian brothers and sisters in church. It's been oddly... More people of the Mormon faith and Jewish brothers and sisters out there. And so I, uh, I, I want to ask you, with, in light of what's going on with me growing up in Chicago, um, and, and, and obviously Kanye West is from Chicago, and you probably might have an inkling about where I'm going with this. Yeah, you know, conversations with us in Chicago with uh, brothers of the Jewish faith we're usually in court. <laughs> we're usually, and some of the best lawyers were of uh, of, of Jewish uh, Jewish background. So, uh, can you explain to us and educate us uh, on some of the stereotypes there? Because because I don't know, but it's in the news, it's in the media. I'm like, what does this mean? What does anti-Semitic mean? Can you please help us understand what that is? Yeah. Look, um, I really do believe that uh, people are best served by focusing on their best interests. It's not at all greedy. As a matter of fact, when you are focused on your best interests and they correspond with my best interests, we have what's called a free market voluntary transaction, which makes us both better off. And the last thing that we ought to be doing is being distracted by group politics and uh, identity struggles, because that only helps uh, people who have seized political power. But in terms of uh, uh, you and me and our brothers and sisters, they're not helped by that at all. So, no. so yes, I'll tell you that uh, I uh, believe in free speech. I, I believe that uh, people should be penalized for things that they do wrong, not things that they say are wrong, because um, uh, speech should generate conversation and even debate uh, or even argument. But uh, action is something else. And so to tell you the honest truth, I would love to hear a definition of anti-Semitism. I have absolutely no idea what it is. If I make wow. the statement, which you know that I have very often, um, that Jews are disproportionately good with money. I've heard people say, well, if that was said by someone who's not Jewish, that would be anti-Semitism. To which I say that that is unadulterated bilge water because it is impossible that the removal of a small piece of skin on my member can convert bigotry into research. That's rubbish. Yeah. I don't buy that. And so um, uh, the, the, the notion that I need laws of anti-Semitism to stop somebody painting a, a swastika on a synagogue, mm. hey, that's vandalism. There's supposed to be laws in place already for that. I don't need any additional laws. So 
As far as I'm concerned, um, I honestly do not know. To me, it seems like a thought crime. It looks like it's a way of trying to attack people for things we claim are in their head. Look, half the time, I don't know what's in my own head. I certainly don't know what's in yours. And, you know, only God knows what's in the human heart. So um, I, I think it's a lot of distraction. It's a lot of noise about nothing. It's a lot of people trying to get brownie points by uh, penalizing the guy. They don't like the, the comments he's made. And now, you know, then Chappelle jokes about it on, on his comedy show and everybody has to jump on him. Uh, look, I'll tell you, when there is an equivalent speech law about anti-Christianism, then I'll be more interested. But there isn't. And so you get politicians, you get show business people uh, who speak in vile and reprehensible terms about those who believe in Jesus. And that's okay. Open, open market there. No problem. Mm -hmm. Say what you like. But if you say something about Jewish people, oh, you got, you know, the roof falls in on you. Uh, if you say something about black people, like, what happens if somebody says, hey, um, a disproportionate amount of violent crime is committed by black males. Is, is that a racist statement? Mm. I have no idea because I don't know what racism means. Same as where I don't know what anti-Semitism means. Is the truth yep. a defense? Can you say, well, I was just telling the truth. Is yep. that a defense against the charge of anti-Semitism? Hey, you know, there, there are far too many, not too many, but there are disproportionate numbers of Jews on the Forbes list of 400 richest Americans. That's a fact. And so since it's a fact, is it proof against anti-Semitism? Well, apparently not. So yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. but uh, to me, it's a huge waste of time. It's a huge distraction from things we ought to be focusing on because it means absolutely nothing whatsoever. Um, you know, uh, they, yep. they try to hang Mel Gibson out to dry because of things he said about Jews when he was drunk. Okay, look, I'm, I'm sorry, but... Uh, if we don't hold people fully responsible for the crimes they commit while they're drunk, I don't see why <laughs> responsible for things they say when they're drunk. I, you know, um, I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's not reasonable. And it's, it's, it's employed as a political bludgeon to silent political dissent. I, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. Uh, if I, if I do something wrong, throw the book at me. But if you think I'm thinking something wrong, you know, I, I, I have a single gesture for you. And uh, if you if you don't like what I say, you know, turn me off. Go listen to something else instead. Yeah. But this idea of trying to silence people who say things you don't like, that is the road to barbarism. That's not the way civilization is maintained. And anybody who is distracted from their prime purpose by that is wasting their time. Stay focused on building your finances. Stay focused on building your family. Stay focused on building your community and um, think in terms of individual success, not group indictments. Yep. Yeah, because I, I, got, I got a bunch of articles here, uh, Rabbi, that, uh, you know, 50% you know, of, of uh, Hollywood is run by, 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 uh, by, by Jewish um, ex uh, executive producers and owners. But here's the way I look at it. We, we rent every year the MGM Grand Arena for our annual convention. Which I'll one of these days, uh, if you can find time in your schedule, I'd love for you to be my guest at our annual convention with 10,000 people there. But MGM, uh, uh, MGM is really uh, a combination of three Jewish names. You know, uh, a, a, a Metro, uh, a Goldman, uh, and Mayor, uh, MGM. Yeah, yeah and I'm like, Metro, the Goldwyn and, Goldwyn and Mayor were the two Jewish. Sure. Look, uh, here's the important thing to understand. Um, if you are a tribalist, then you assume that everybody who looks like you is your brother and mm -hmm. thinks like you. Yep. Um, look, I'm sorry, but uh, I do not find myself in agreement with every uh, bald Jewish rabbi. I just don't. Um, and the idea that Jews agree with one another, you know, is complete nonsense. A number of years ago, Joe Lieberman uh, ran with Al Gore on the Democratic ticket. I think it was 2000. And a whole lot of people said, well, as a rabbi, I'm sure you're supporting Joe Lee. Look, I wouldn't support Joe Lieberman and Al Gore if they were the last people on the planet they wouldn't <laughs> get my vote uh, because I disagree with them philosophically. And the fact that uh, we are both Americans of Jewish ancestry is completely irrelevant. 
and uh, the idea that um, yeah. that because somebody is of Jewish ancestry, we share a great deal in common with one another, it's simply not true. And the, the idea that, well, all the Jews in Hollywood must like one another and collaborate with one another and cooperate with one another and try to further one another's interests. Mm-hmm. Look, if you believe that, then I've got a bridge I want to sell you. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's rubbish. Yeah. That's right. And and when you're when you're looking, and, and by the way, I I, I thank the MGM uh, uh, Grand for pro- providing a venue and a service and hotel for us to hold a convention in. And you provide a service, yeah. I provide a rev- I provide revenue. It's a w- it's a win win. Of course, uh, it is situation. You know, of course it is, and that's why I believe that making money is a wonderful refutation of of bigotry and uh, and. Uh, political attempts to drive wedges between groups of people. The fact is the only color I'm interested in is the color green. And the only race I'm cared about, I care about is the human race. So amen to that. That's it's, uh, you, why you and I are vibing. I want to ask you this. I want to ask you this because one of your videos that uh, I've watched over and over was your breakdown of an article that uh, I think was it here. Uh, that was it. 70% of all high income earning men have wives that stay at home, yes, that's and quite so, right. Uh, so I, I, I need to ask you, why did that? Why did that? Uh, why did that garner so much attention from you? And why did you? Why did you have a reaction to it the way you did? Well, it's it's nice to call it attention. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's it was attention like Niagara is a drizzly faucet. Um, it was they, <laughs> they they tried to kill me on it. <laughs> they really did. Uh, it, it angered people so much, but. Um, but it, it's hugely important because uh, the fact is that the the magic of marriage produces uh, increased economic success. So much so that the Wall Street Journal uh, two weeks ago ran a, an article that got a lot of attention uh, saying that people, couples who live together, do not seem to uh, generate the same kind of economic benefits that couples who marry do. And they were scratching their heads. Now, it's always fun to see newspapers oh. scratching their heads. But because they're saying, well, what's the difference between being, married, between being married and shacking up? And the answer is, if you have to ask that question, you are a moron. <laughs> or else you are so politically indoctrinated that you can't think straight anymore. But, of course, there's a huge difference. And so, uh, yes, um, just on on one level, man, having a wife at home, and I'm I'm fully cognizant of the fact that many couples um, have to have uh, both partners working. I get I get that because taxes have risen so far, so much over the last few decades, and uh, the costs of regulation, the costs of living, inflation going on right now. So I totally understand that if there's if there's no option, there's no option. But uh, yeah. but. Uh, I've worked with many couples who have adjusted their spending in order to make it possible for mom to be home. And not only is this good for kids, but the great thing is it adds to the man's earning potential. First of all, he's able to work harder with an internal comfort level of knowing that his children are not with a, a daycare that couldn't care less, but his children are with their mom. Uh, Number two, um, all of us, because we're human beings, we all will work harder for an outside cause than for ourselves. So if if all I'm doing is working in order to be able to upgrade my car, eh, you know what, if Monday is uh, is a nice day, I'd rather go fishing than go to work. You know, that's what I'll do. But if I'm working to support a wife and maybe children – I have a totally different attitude towards it. Under those circumstances, going to work is an act of masculine honor. Yep. And I will do it on Monday, even if I'd rather go fishing. And so um, uh, the, for that and, in, and many, many other reasons, the fact is it's, it, it is true that, um, that having a wife who's home is a huge asset to a man who wants to make money. Uh, Rabbi Levin, how long have you been married now to uh... – to your wife? Um, to Susan. Um, gosh, if she sees this show, she probably will. And then, <laughs> we're gonna, we're and then a special she clip right for her. <laughs> sees, sees me hesitating. 
it's um i know we've been married longer than we weren't uh, but that doesn't say much because we we got married in our in our well i got married in my early 30s she got married in her early 20s um we sure. have been married for uh, oh gosh about 40 years so so my, you know when i'm when i got married uh she Sheena and I have been together for 10 years. It was, we've been married. It was going to be eight years in uh, February. And I've done more in my life, um, mentally, spiritually, and financially. And financially. And physically, I was physically say, yeah. uh, in the last seven years than as a single dad for the previous 14. And then my, yeah. as my life as a United States Marine uh, before that for eight years and my whole teenage, teenage upbringing, I can't tell you how much I don't have to look over my back. I have a woman I can trust, and that projects into my, my business dealing subconsciously. And I'm not even realizing that it's happening, but I, I have so much comfort, safety, and security, not knowing that I have to check my phone and wonder where my girl's at, wonder where my girl, who's she talking to, and I don't have to worry about who's on whose phone, et cetera, et cetera. I think that goes into the intrinsic evolution. Of no, us that's that's exactly part of it. Absolutely. And that's why – Although today you're not allowed to do this, it used to be absolutely normal. IBM, uh, in the good old days, as it were, or the bad old days, depending on your perspective, IBM used to have a policy that senior executives could only be hired once the wives had been interviewed as well. Um, In other words, uh, they, they wanted to know that the guy they were hiring was in a good marriage because they knew that if the marriage went bad, it was going to be impossible for the guy to focus on work, obviously. And they also would not have considered hiring a senior exec who was not in a mar- not married and stably married. Um, you know, on a very subtle level, Matt, and I, this, is, this is very, this is spiritual. Uh, there is no instrument that can measure. There's no thermometer we can point at somebody's head that will tell us this. But from the depth of one human soul to another, each one of us knows that we have more trust in a man whose wife trusts him than in a single, and then in a single man, we just do. Uh, You know, uh, in your experience, uh, Rabbi Lappin, um, the way men and women treat money, what are the differences? What would you say the top three, four, five differences are that, that women treat money with versus men? There's two kinds of women, Matt, single women and married women. What are we talking about? Let's let's say single because I think uh, if if you're dating as a large part of our audience as as uh, single to, to to early married men uh, of, of the seven figures. Okay, so, so let's talk, let's talk in, single. In general, in in general, uh, to the extent that generalities are true, which in general they are, <laughs> um, men are attracted to to women with beauty, and women are attracted to men with status. Uh, because with status comes security. And it's a subconscious thing. Right. Completely. Wow. Now, uh, years ago, there used to be a humorous thing called the Darwin Awards that were given to people who killed themselves. Postum- it was an award given posthumously to people who killed themselves doing incredibly stupid things. Oh, my God. Okay. So, uh, you know, there was the guy who wanted to catch fish. So he took a stick of dynamite waded into the middle of a big pond and then uh, uh, dropped the dynamite as it was about to explode into the water. And it did. It, it did kill a whole lot of fish that floated to the surface, but it also killed him. Uh, and that guy won a, Do- a Darwin Award one year. My point is that in all the years that I followed the Darwin Awards, I never, ever heard of a woman winning it <laughs> because really stupid, reckless things tend to be done by men, not by women. Hence now, why we, in the insurance we, business, why men spend more money for life insurance costs per thousand than women. Obviously, yeah, right. It makes sense. If you were running an insurance company, it's exactly what you'd do. Yeah. So um, what stops men from doing stupid things? Well, usually uh, getting married and, and having children. That's what stops. So um, a lot of guys who are into extreme sports cut back on that when they get married. Now, uh, the, this is all by way of answering your question that in general, men will be, will take greater risks with money than women will. Now we're speaking about not married, single men, single women, uh, in general, single men will, will make riskier investments and go for all or nothing or double or quits. 
uh, women will not. Women build a safety fund um, in general, and uh, and and that's just just again, it's a huge difference between men and women. X Y chromosomes do have a, uh, a yes. consequence on on how you handle money. Uh, Rabbi, one of my uh, I, I, what viral videos or viral reels, IG reels, was uh, was a young man who was asking me. Um, how do you know whether or not you can trust a businessman or not? I said, one of the, for me, an early tell is if we're having lunch together and this married man is constantly looking at women all over the restaurant, flirting with the server, and I get, I get one look of appreciation. Okay, it's a beautiful one, but he's constantly ogling and doing that. And to me, to me that's a tell. I got, I got so many hateful comments my way. So there's a difference between your personal life in your business life, but is that true, Rabbi Lappin? Do you think there is a difference um, between your personal and business life? Um, that, that's two separate. That's two separate questions. I think. First of all, um, I have a slightly different uh, thing to rely on, and that is reputation. To me, okay. that's, that okay. that governs everything. Um, if uh, if there are a number of people that I speak to, and they all have nothing but good things to say about the guy. Uh, that is wonderful because reputation means that the person has a long string of uh, good relationships behind him. Um, that is a very, very, very good indicator. Um, again, if he if he has a, a wandering eye, um, uh, you know, I'd I'd notice it, but um, uh, but. There are guys who have a wandering eye. Uh, their own wives roll their eyes. They know about it, but they also know they trust their husbands implicitly, and they, they trust him with good sense. So I, I know guys like that who, who just can't help flirting and, <laughs> okay. and, and have an eye, but, but they're so absolutely solid guys. But nobody who's a solid guy has a bad reputation, and nobody who has a, uh, a good reputation um, has, has bad things. It, that's not the way it works. Reputation is a wonderful thing, and it's the whole reason why people pay more for a brand product than they will for a, a generic product. It's yep. because of something called reputation. And when Lee Iacocca, as the president of Chrysler, spent a billion and a half dollars buying the Jeep brand, um, he got absolutely nothing. There were no factories. There were no inventory. Jeep had been run into the ground by Renault. And there was, there was one small little warehouse in uh, Ontario, Canada. But basically, for his billion and a half dollars, all he got was reputation. Wow. And that is that America was still filled with guys who uh, remembered Jeep. It was filled with guys who had served in the military and driven Jeep or had their lives right. saved in a Jeep. And that's what he bought. Reputation is hugely important. So I'd put reputation ahead of anything. Uh, the argument today is that in Western society, in the Western world, there is no benefit to being married because you build this life up and she takes half and a man doesn't stand a day in court, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I, I was exposed to this too as a single dad and I had custody of the kids and I still had a bad forthcoming reputation coming into the court where I had to tell the judge, hey, judge, you might think this of other men, but I have got custody of the kids. Because the judge was already judging me, uh, being a dead be dad coming into court, and so, what what would your argument? What would your response to that argument be? Is there a financial benefit for men to actually be married? Because it said, Let, let's just shack up together. You're my one, but uh, I'm not so sure if I'm going to get married because of the legal system of the Western world. Yeah, I I totally I totally I I really absolutely get that and. Without knowing anything about the background, all I can say is whenever a, get, a, a dad gets custody, uh, he must be a, a really extraordinary stand-up kind of man because the courts do favor women in this situation, and, and guys are right. If it gets as far as court, you will get a bad deal. You will. Uh, so isn't that a reason not to get married? Um, no, look, uh, there are uh, approximately uh, – about 30,000 fatalities on American highways from car accidents every year. And there are many, many more accidents where nobody got killed, but there are injuries, and there are many, many more accidents where nobody got hurt, but a car got wrecked. Yeah, I got you. Just look at those statistics. That's a lot of numbers. 
is that a reason for me to not go out and buy a, a lovely car that I enjoy? <laughs> no, of course, it, of course it isn't. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to drive if I'm drunk. I'm not going to drive recklessly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure I drive within my limitations and more importantly, within the limitations of other people I see on the highway. Uh, could something still happen? Yeah, but the chances are down. Look, um, you got to get married right. And that means the time to come talk to your rabbi is not when you and your wife are headed to the courtroom and you're going to argue about uh, alimony and custody. That's too late. The time to talk to me is before you get engaged. And you're going to explain to me, number one, what's wrong with her? What are the downsides to her? And if you can't answer that, then I'd say stop it. Stop it. You're not an adolescent. You've got to be able to say, hey, you know what? She's not perfect and neither am I. And here, here is the areas in which she's not perfect. If you, if you can't identify her own imperfections uh, as well as yours, um, not a time to get married. Number two, uh, you know, tell me what's great about her. And um, if you say something like, well, I really like the way that she interacts with her parents and her siblings, we're getting somewhere. Yeah. But if you tell me you're in love with her, um, then I need a bath bucket. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I'm allergic to dumb people. I really am. And so this notion that, oh, I love her. We're in love. If you get married on that basis, you deserve everything that's coming to you. And, and plenty is coming to you. Oh, yeah. Look, this, is, this is a stupidity. Um, I, you know, I won't go into the details of it now of what love really means and what men really mean. When, oh, I love her. Um, no, look, uh, that's, that's not the reason. That's not the way to get married. And so when, when you get married correctly and you conduct your marriage the way a marriage ought to be conducted by a man, um, then you're not going to have a road accident. You're not going to have a car wreck. Right, right. And that's all there is to it. Um, so the statistics themselves mean nothing at all. The main problem is that nobody has taught guys how to get married. I say guys because they are the, the prime, um, um, what is the word? They, they are the prime wrongdoers in, in this area. Guys, uh, guys destroy marriages far more than women do. Uh, when, when women do... And, they, and plenty of women do, it's usually in response to a guy not being a man or not being a smart man or not being a good man. So I'm sorry, yeah. but uh, this really is on men more than on women. Um, you know, if you say that, like I said, uh, the courts will not give you a fair shake if you're a guy, but that's irrelevant because if you get married the way I teach you to get married, I teach all my young men get married properly, you're never going to see the inside of a courtroom. And for that matter, by the way, neither will your children. You know, I'm, I'm reading here in, in Genesis uh, chapter 3, you, you're talking about uh, the responsibility of man. And when Adam and Eve, you know, bit, you know ate the, uh, the forbidden fruit, God went looking for them in the Garden of, Eve, Garden of Eden, and, and God was looking for the man first. Yes, that's right. He was, he was looking for the man. So... Um, and the man and his wife, it says here in, in verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, and he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Not Eve, yes. but a man. And that's the, he, the Hebrew word, Matt, the Hebrew word of where are you in Hebrew is ayeka. And what that means has got a twofold meaning. On its simplest level, it means, hey, I can't see you. Are you like... Are you behind a bush? Where are you? On its deeper meaning, it's like we might say to a friend who we worried about, hey, man, where are you at? What's Got with it. you? And, and, that's, and that's what's going on here as well. Um, you know, he, you, I put you in the garden <laughs> like yesterday, and you've already screwed up. Where, what's with you, man? <laughs> I find it fair, fairly interesting they but that point, about. your point is 100%. Yeah. Very, Very often in, in marriage counseling, when a couple comes in, uh, it's, it's quite common for me to send the woman home 
and say, I don't need to talk to you. I just need to talk to your husband. But men don't want to hear that. You know, a lot of well, guys don't want to hear the Men who are not willing to man up don't want to hear it. Roger that. Um, how, can, how can men take more of a, uh, you know, like what you just said there? Because uh, sometimes when people say man up, you feel like you're demasculating them. Or but that's the truth, though. Um, so so uh, how, how do we how do men in today's society? Uh, our CEO Patrick Bay David talk about the rise of the low of the low the low masculine men, and the, the the rise of the weak man in the twenty yes. in the, you know in twenty twenty two twenty twenty three. Uh, where so so most importantly most importantly uh, one has to understand the link between money and marriage. Okay, and so uh, I would say to guys. Um, don't even think of getting married uh, until you have decent revenue, until you are creating wealth, until, until you are making money. Now, that doesn't have to be millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but uh, it, it, you do have to be on an ambitious track. So getting married before that's taken care of is, is really calamitous because, uh, in general, women, although they will claim a lot of different reasons, uh, very often the reasons that women can't stand being with a man any longer is that they feel he has no ambition. And so uh, I, I know a, a case, and I mean, an example I can give you of a woman was talking to me. She said, oh, I loved him. We were both in art school. We were both in art school and, and we were we were making beautiful paintings and we were so in love. And I said, so what happened? She says, well, we graduated and I got a job in industrial design and I'm making $85,000 a year. And, uh, well, he's still uh, sitting in the kitchen trying to paint paintings. And right. I said, so what bothers you? She said, well, I'm just worried about the future. Well, you're right to be worried about the future because he isn't. <laughs> so um, so I'm sorry, but, but that's a really important one. Number two. Um, if you uh, if you're a guy and you marry a woman who's making more money than you are, and there's nothing going to change, you know, it's maybe you're in graduate school and you're going to graduate with a with a great degree from a professional school, and in four years' time you're going to be making serious money. That that's fine. If if during this period you're in school, you know, she's earning and you're not, that that can work just fine. But the, outside of that situation. Marriages where the woman makes more money than the man are not long for this world. Their statistics are appalling. They just don't last. And so overlooking the financial role, and, and again, I'm sorry to harp on this. I don't want to become tiresome, but what men do is, well, we love each other. No, stop with the rubbish. Talk yeah. to me about money. It's interesting that you say it because it, you, you often think that men uh, marry, marry a woman and, or, or they feel hurt. More, I, I would, I would argue to think that men, because I'm talking my own personal experience, hurt more in, during a breakup or in divorce because they gave their world to her. Yes, and it didn't work out, and then now he's he's felt like boop, he's felt like this, yes. and she keeps half or whatever case we. And the, the only case. the only compensation the good Lord gave us is that we retain our sexual vitality for much longer than women do. <laughs> And so and that's Abraham. why it drives <laughs> it, it drives women mad when their friends and their therapists tell them to get divorced, and then they get divorced and they're lonely and and uh, and um, isolated. Meanwhile, their ex husband is dating and gets remarried pretty quickly. It, it bugs them really bad. Yeah, but yeah. It, that's just how the world really works. Gotcha. And he's uh, fifty five, sixty years old, and having more kids. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it happens. Uh, yeah. Anthony Quinn, the actor, um, had uh, a baby when he was in his late 70s. Gotcha. You know, when, um, Rabbi, since you and I had last spoken, I actually came out with a book. Oh, I, wonderful. I, Do I, tell. I came out with a book called Faith Made Millionaire, and it became a, a, an Amazon uh, bestseller in three different categories. And why, and so, do you not, why did you not get a jacket blurb on the back from me? Uh, my bad. My bad. You're correct. You're correct. I, I uh, will we'll fix that issue. Um, I've got another book coming out 
Uh, Good, excellent. This is starting. To, this is starting to become a. Thing. Did you, you know, I'm a big. You know, I'm a big fan of what you do. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Lappin. And uh, I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you about this because it was a, a checklist that I was I was putting together about the checklist for for, for being for being married. Um, but you, you've obviously added to it, and in the next edition of this book will have your quotes. And just so you know, we we quoted you in here uh, many many times. Uh, in this book too as well. But I, I, w- I wanted to ask you because oftentimes people think that, you know, uh, you know, uh, th- uh, there's, there's between fear and faith. And, and how do we strengthen in, 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 you, in, your, in your work, in your experience? It's very knee-jerk reaction to buy into our fears all the time, especially now yeah. inflation is high. Economists predict that next year, 100% chance of a recession. Interest rates are climbing higher. People aren't buying their homes. Uh, people potentially may be laid off. So there's a lot of triggering effects that potentially may be happening. We're officially in a, we're in a housing recession right now. So it's very easy to buy into your fear right away. But you and I both know that a lot of millionaires and businesses started during a recession. Oh, it's, it's a great time, yes. Uh, money can be made at any time regardless of what's going on in the economy. Uh, absolutely. I mean, just to give you one example – uh, it's a great time to be buying income property now from people who are overextended. Correct. And then, so how how do we create more of a knee-jerk reaction instead of, okay, this is my fear, but how yeah. do we get to the point where like, so, we're strength, uh, strengthening our the faith? Answer, the answer is exactly the answer that you would have given me back when you were a, mar- a Marine, or you, you're always a Marine. But uh, hey, when, so, you, There you go, Rabbi. <laughs> when, uh, when, when you were on active duty, and I would have said to you, Matt, surely there are times you, you're just downright scared. And the sure. answer is, <laughs> you know, absolutely. And here's how I overcome it and I push ahead. Yeah. And it's recognizing that um, there are certain default conditions that the good Lord built into us. Let me give you a few examples. Laziness. The desire to do as little as possible while still being able to eat well, that's a human default condition. Um, the commitment to work hard and produce, you have to develop that. It's not, it's, you, you're not born with that. Cowardice. Cowardice is a default condition. You'll see it in most animals. Courage. Courage you have to work at. Got it. And in exactly the same way that it's too... It's true for active duty military personnel. It's true in the business world as well. That it's we you have to recognize your weaknesses, and you say to yourself, "Yeah, I I realize that um, I have an instinct to laziness. Now I have to overcome that, and here are the steps I'm going to take to overcome it." Yes, I recognize I have an, uh, a default instinct to yield to my fears and panic. Now yep. here's how I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to put them out of mind. I'm going to replace sitting around worrying with an action. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you just said that we had to work at courage, you know, and I'm thinking the first time I jumped out of a perfectly good aircraft with a parachute, I'm thinking <laughs> yes. about being dropped in the middle of the ocean and being fearful of sharks because I grew up watching Jaws. I remember, you know, just dealing with bombs, bullets, and bad guys and just, just, just fury just coming your way. And the, the thing that I use to still do it was number one. I trusted the men, the men around me. Yes. We trusted our training. We trusted the safety uh, of our equipment and the usage of our equipment. Uh, I would say those are the top three things they used to strengthen my courage. So if, if we would translate that to money, we, translating we to do- connection with other people is crucial. Uh, you're not going to make money in isolation. You do have to have a community of people. And it, but before I wrap up, Rabbi Lappin, um, I love having conversations with you and you know, I, my whole, whole entire life, since I was 20 years old, I always wanted to talk to more mature men than me that have been there, done that three, four, five times well over me. They run laps around me and, uh, and you've served that uh, purpose for me your, through your books, uh, through your videos, our conversations like this. Um, what, what counsel would you give, especially that to, to, highlight that point you just made that you have to surround yourself with people. What counsel would you give for, for a person watching this right now and how to go about the crisis they were about to face as a country, 
Uh, Trump says he's writing for president. Uh, you know, what, what, you know, the cancel culture that we're in, you know, what advice and guidance would you give for somebody right now say, okay, I need to recruit like-minded thinkers around me. What's, what's the best thought process and financial process here as we go um, forward? To number one, avoid, uh, distracting, um, activities, uh, to try to avoid being distracted by irrelevancies. Uh, yes, I know the inflation rate, official inflation rate is 8%. I've got news for you. The real inflation rate is nearly double that. The, the government is lying on that figure. It's not 8%. It's over 13%. Anybody who has shopped uh, for anything from diesel oil to uh, cleaning detergent to apples over the last two years knows exactly what's going on. And um, uh, But it's irrelevant. You've got to make money right now. You've got to increase your revenue. Is there 15% inflation out there? May well be, probably. Well, great. I have to now make 15% more money than I did last year. That's what I've got to do. Now, uh, key way of, of doing that, making sure that you're not alone, that you're building a community. And in my book, Thou Shall Prosper, I, I devote one-tenth of the book um, to building community and building connections. Um Number one, uh, nothing that you're not measuring can grow. And so uh, if you're trying to lose weight, well, then you need a scale and a notebook. You need to keep a record. Otherwise, you're never going to. Uh, you need to know how to keep financial statements. If you're hoping to increase your revenue, then you'd better learn how to measure money. And finally, if you're looking to increase your social connectivity, then you need to absolutely find a way of uh, measuring that as well. And one way of measuring that is, is very, very simple, and that is a list of names of people who are your friends, not relatives, you know, not people you owe money to, uh, not Facebook friends, but people who will return your phone call within 24 hours regardless. Uh, and you'll see, you know, it's, it's not that many people. And you, you need to work on increasing that. How do you work on increasing that? Find ways of doing favors for other people. Realize that uh, you have no right to anyone else's anything. There is no such thing. Uh, and this is a hard lesson to learn because the culture encourages each of us to find ways in which we're victims. Mm. Mm. And, so, um, and so, no, I, I am not a victim. Uh, as a matter of fact, I am a giver, not a taker, and uh, I look for ways to to be helpful to other people. I look for ways to do favors for other people. Seek them out. Seek ways to do that, so as that you will build up your circle of connectivity. Make sure that you have identified the best way in which you can serve other people, and make sure other people know what it is. You know, I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're going to start a, a driving service to, to take people to the airport, or maybe you're going to start a bookkeeping service, or maybe you're, you're looking to put together an investment syndicate to buy a, a four-unit uh, apartment building. Whatever it is, let, you've got to be able to express what you can do for other people in less time than it takes for an elevator to go up one floor, called an elevator statement. And um, with those two things, you start increasing your financial envelope and you but don't, don't care about who's in politics, who's running, who's not running, um, what the official rate is, what's the government doing. I'm not saying the stuff is irrelevant. I'm saying you can't do anything about it anyway, so ignore it and get on to the things that you can do something about. Yeah. And then go ahead and do it. And Rabbi Levin, I appreciate you. And, and by the way, for those of you know uh, that don't know, uh, 2002, Rabbi Lapin wrote his best-selling book, Thou Shall Prosper, The Ten Commandments for Making Money, which is published through, through Wiley, which is awesome. And, uh, and to this day, it's still making moves. And uh, I, I pray one of these days I write a book, too, as well, following your footsteps that 20 years later, people are yeah. still talking about it and uh, still referencing it. So uh, no, it, it, sells, it sells more each year than it did the year before. Crazy, just momentum, yeah. momentum like that. 
So uh, make sure you check out his uh, YouTube channel, which is Rabbi Daniel Lappin, too, as well. So, uh, Rabbi, any final thoughts before I let you go? Anything you want to send out to the, the viewers of the Seven Figure Squad? Uh, just focus on your five Fs, even though you don't necessarily yet know how they impact each other. Focus on your family, your finance, your physical fitness, your faith, and your friendships. They are the five Fs. It's my newest book, and uh, I speak about it on uh, my YouTube channel all the time. Um, those five Fs all help each other in ways you cannot imagine. Uh, there's magic in the arithmetic of how one and one doesn't e even equal two, but it equals seven. Sometimes it equals 39. Sometimes it equals 700. Uh, you've just got to know how to employ the magic arithmetic of your five Fs, and uh, please do it. Forget, forget all the distractions. Focus on your family, on your faith, on your finances, on your physical fitness, and your friendships. Rabbi Lappin, once again, I appreciate our conversation together again. I look forward to get together with you in person. And yes, the next book coming out. Folks, would you like to see Rabbi Daniel Lappin here share something in the back of the <laughs> next book coming out? Uh, you just might in... People have been asking us too, Rabbi Lappin, uh, when are we going to put together an event together? So I don't know, Ivan, I think we need to get to 1 million subs. I think that'd be a, an early goal. If we get to 1 million subs here on the YouTube channel, we'll put together a conference. And, and if, if that happens, then Rabbi Lappin, the first phone call to be a speaker at that conference would be you. I look forward to that. I look okay. forward to that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So if you're watching this, everybody, make sure you follow Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Daniel Lappin.com as well as his, his website. And uh, if you watch this video and you got value from it, please consider hitting like. If you watch a couple of other, other videos, please consider hitting subscribe, hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. Please drop your thoughts, your comments, your questions, your feedback. You agree with him? You don't agree with him? Don't agree with me? You agree with me? Please, we want to know. We'd like to engage with our audience here at the Seven Figure Squad. That being said, on behalf of Rabbi Daniel Lappin, I'm your money smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.